go. All right, we are live. Today is the 2nd of March, 2023. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour Live. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify so that many thousands of other people can find this content and together we can speed the energy transition. Welcome to the show, my co-host and the commercial solar guy, John Weaver. Hey, Tim, I hope you're doing well. And I know we're gonna be talking about land because that's what we were talking about just before we hit the record button. Well, the question and, for uh, you, John, the question yeah. is, and, and I, want, I want an answer, man, is how much <laughs> land would it require to get most of our electricity from wind and solar? Because this is a question on so many people's minds. It's a great question, and the answer might shock you, but what is your answer? Hey, I'll do my first answer just to have some fun. Technically, we don't need to use any land. We could float it all on the ocean and then have power lines coming in. Uh, I, I know, that. but that's an that end response. around. Yeah, yeah, so we could have fun with it. Um, for the United States, hypothetically, we could get 40 to 50% of our electricity from rooftops, and then we could get the other 50% from parking lots if we wanted. So there's that path. Um, we could uh, get 10 to 15, 10 to 20% floating solar, maybe 10 but 10 to 15, um, we could, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to get solar electricity. I, I even read once that if we were to transition all of the nation's uh, windows to electric solar windows, we could get like 15-ish percent of our electricity from that. So we could get 100% of our electricity without installing a single solar panel on the land. We could get 100% if, of our if electricity we wanted to. Without installing a single Sorry. So that's what I that's what I sound like. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry everybody. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> you sound good. You sound good. And yeah, you know, so there's a story in the Union of Concerned Scientists blog by a gentleman named Steve Clemmer, very smart guy. He is the Director of Energy Research and Analysis at the UCS, as we call them. And if you're not familiar with the Union of Concerned Scientists, check them out, just Google that. It's ucsusa.org. They're a nonprofit dedicated to science, environmental health, and a safer, healthier future for humanity. And there's no BS there, and it's, it's great, credible scientific information. So anyway, he has broken down from a bunch of different resources like NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, what we have concluded about greening the grid. And he includes, you know, great statistics on, well, what is the Biden administration goal? For example, cutting U.S. emissions 50% below 20, 2005 levels by 2030, right? And, you know, my mantra, John, is that we're gonna, we're gonna 10X the amount of solar on the grid by 2050. We're gonna go from a 5% solar grid today to a 50% solar grid in 2050. Now that's, what, 27 years away. And, but it's, it is astounding growth. And, but, we are not going to pave over the breadbasket to achieve this, John, right? As you pointed out, we could just use the ocean. 70% uh, of the Earth is ocean, and 70% of the Earth's population lives near the ocean. Uh, so it's quite economical in the greater scheme of things to put floating solar and wind on the ocean. And Mark Jacobson talks about this in his new book. Um, so. If, if you you know really want to geek out on the science, check out Mark Jacobson uh, at Stanford University. But the answer is one to two percent um, using you know all the traditional sources that we know: rooftop solar, ground mount solar, small utility solar, large utility solar, and then of course utility wind. And you know we use forty percent of our land, John for growing cows, sheep, pigs, livestock, right? 40% of our real estate in this country goes to those food sources. 
And so if we can't afford one to 2% for a clean grid for a safer, healthier future, we can't, we can't afford a future basically, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we use more land for golf courses than we would need to make clean electricity. We use as much land as maybe like, uh, what was it, front yard grass, like that green stuff um, that has no purpose other than pure aesthetics. Um, we use more lands by far for oil extraction. If we were to simply turn all land that's used for oil and coal into solar land, we'd 100% cover our solar. So this argument that people say, oh, it takes up too much land, it's really just and a talking point for lower educated individuals. I know that sounds really mean, but it's just, it's just to manipulate people. And yep. it comes up constantly just because we have to create fear in our U.S. political model. So I love these. I love bringing up the stats about these numbers and showing people what the real numbers are. Um, you know, I, uh, there's a, a, a famous quote out there that says a 10,000 square mile chunk somewhere in Arizona could power the whole nation. And, you know, 100 by 100 mile square. This nation has like, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how many square miles a nation is. Hundreds of thousands, millions. Um, and we got plenty of land space. We don't, land isn't the question. The question is, are we going to build power lines to move that electricity? Are we going to incentivize the higher cost for rooftops, for parking lots? And, and you know, the picture you have on here, it's, that just shows something. We could... I mean, we have so much land. We have gifts of land. Oh, there it is, right in the middle. I love that one. Uh, oil and gas leases on federal land. Right there. If we used that land, yep. we could power the nation. Yep. Let's, let's trade it out. Now, it's not that easy, of course, but it's just land is not the challenge. Look uh, at the corn to it, ethanol square, right? The corn to ethanol yes. real estate is greater than we would need to entirely green our grid. And using corn for ethanol is hugely inefficient. Science mm -hmm. on that is that it's 100 times less efficient energetically than it is to just convert farmland to solar PV and get electricity straight out of it and use the electricity to drive your car or run your factory, right? Corn Correct. to ethanol is a boondoggle. And our government subsidizes that industry because the farm lobby is so powerful and Correct. I can't blame them for doing that. That's in their best interest, right? Um, growing cash crops, corn and beans, in this case, corn for ethanol, is profitable. But it's totally dependent on subsidies. Now, I, we have to be careful when we talk subsidies because renewable energy is also a subsidized industry. But when you think about the impact on the land and human health and the environment and other living things and a safer future. Well, there's no better way, <laughs> really, right, to create a safer, healthier future for humanity than to clean the grid. That is, and, a, you know, a penultimate solution, so to speak. It solves the climate crisis and it saves the lives of six million people every year. A holocaust every year is happening because we burn fossil fuels and we need to really drill this into our heads and understand this that this is massive suffering and loss of life and dumbing people down and yeah and of course with climate change ultimately there's going to be massive migration of huge huge numbers of people who are going to come to the midwest because they don't have a place to live where they can have enough to eat and when that happens, all hell breaks loose and the wheels come off of society and you're living in an apocalypse. And I don't want to live in an ap apocalypse and I don't want my grandchildren to live in an apocalypse either. So it's, and it's just good for the economy too, right? It's good for people, profit and planet. Why yep. don't we want to do this? Um, or why do we want to slow it down? Like we reported on last year can't remember the name of that nonprofit that is fueling nimbyism right in rural communities that just drives me nuts 
I agree. And and I like to throw this one out there just because I like to argue. Um, we don't incentivize renewables. What we do is that we've, for politically palatable purposes, we've renamed carbon tax. We've renamed the pollution tax because we know that people are afraid of the word tax. And mm-hmm. so what we've done is say, okay, society, you're afraid of paying taxes and being responsible for your own activities? Well, then we're going to manipulate you. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this a investment tax credit. So we're going to flip it and we're going to say, you know what? Instead of you people uh, paying a tax, we'll give you a tax credit. And this tax credit really is simply to balance out the pollution that fossils create. And that's why clean energy generation gets tax credits. They're not incentives. They're carbon taxes. And we just had to rename it because society is, you know, we're lazy, we're dumb, we're monkeys still. We got our lizard brain dominating so much of our day to day, and this is what you got to deal with. So, uh, so yeah, um, we got plenty of land, we got plenty of roofs, we got plenty of parking lots, we got plenty of ocean, we have plenty of manufacturing capacity. Like we're we're about to blow off all the arguments that matter. And if people start to say, "Oh, but you got to build power lines." Well, guess what? No, we don't. If you don't do the power lines, we're not going to build solar power in those Midwest regions. We're going to build it locally, and we're going to build a whole bunch of batteries. And we don't need the power lines, and because there's plenty of land in the population centers. You know, I I um I know a really smart guy named Wesley Hirsch. He uh, uh got his PhD from Arizona State University. He works for Amazon. He's just you know love talking to him. Met him recently again. Um, He wrote a document that said within 50 miles of pretty much every population center in the United States is enough land to service it with solar. Yeah. So 75% of the population, 80% lives on the east and west coast. Within 50 miles of that is enough space to feed those people the electricity they need. Great. You don't want to build transmission lines? Don't care. We're going to build batteries. And if you think we don't have enough batteries to build, remember that time back in 2010 you said, oh, solar panels will never scale? Well, you people are going to be wrong again. And it's, it's okay to be wrong, but, you know, just be quiet about being wrong. I mean, I'm with Elon. My goal is to be less wrong. Um, and uh, let's face it, we're, we're mostly wrong. We're mostly oh, ignorant of how the, the universe works. Yes. So let's talk about one of your stories in PV Magazine and, and sure. uh, invite Wesley on the show. We'd love to talk to him on a right. live on a Thursday afternoon. We do this live every Thursday at noon or most Thursdays. If John and I are traveling, we don't do it. But three out of four weekend a week, certainly a month, we're here at noon Eastern, 11 Central, 10 Pacific and nine. Oh, sorry. Nine Pacific, 10 Mountain, 11 Central. Uh, solar produced 4.7 of U.S. electricity in 2022, generation up 25%. What are you talking about, Mr. Weaver, in PV Magazine? So the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, a subset of the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, a lot of big words, um, they put out their annual numbers, and their annual numbers uh, come out in February, late February, because that includes through December. And with that, over the course of 2022, I did some spreadsheets. There's some cool pictures if you want to share the article. We can uh, show a couple images. But um, yeah, in I'm essence, to do that. And, and yeah, here we go. Cool. Um, in essence, the United States uh, generated uh, about 3.8 to 3.9 percent of its electricity from solar PV, solar photovoltaics, last year. Ooh, this is a good image. I like this one. Um, You should zoom in on that chart if you can. Um, But in 2022, that number grew from 3.88% up to 4.7, just greater than it. And that's cool. That's a 20-ish percent growth in percent. So 3.88 to 4.7 grew about 20-25%. But and generation volume also grew 25%. This is in a year in which total electricity grew by 3.5%. So solar would have grown more 
if we hadn't seen such a large growth in our electricity demand this year, which was, uh, which might, you know, which is interesting. Um, And solar's growth more than covered all of the electricity growth in the United States last year. Now, over the, since about 2007, electricity demand has been roughly flat, plus or minus every year. So this is not a new thing. You know, solar growth has been covering electricity growth for a while. But it's just a big year for growth, 3.5%, and it's cool. Now, this chart is really neat because this is the monthly data going back about two years. Uh, and it shows the little low lines of distributed solar per the EIA and the red lines of utility scale, you add those up and you get the blue lines. Now it's probable that the yellow lines undercount the amount of distributed electricity because technically utilities don't know how much is distributed. They guesstimate. They just see that the use at a house has dropped. They see that the use at a business has dropped. They don't know how much is coming. They don't know what changes have occurred. So, So there's that, but at a minimum, in April of last year and in May, we saw greater than 6% of our electricity come from solar. Those are our peak months. And then, of course, we saw uh, January and December be our low months. It's well, the meter spinning know. backwards, don't they now? <clears throat> well, that's only net metered electricity. What about electricity that's being consumed on site? Yeah. yeah. So instantaneously used electricity is not tracked anywhere by anybody except for solar inverter manufacturers and the on-site people so you know end phase and solar solar, the community solar i don't know i mean does the yellow include small utility like community or just uh, rooftop dg it's it's um it's all stuff that's behind the meter because uh and it might be other than just pure behind the meter but the uh, utility scale is all projects that are standalone one megawatt or greater And we know that there's more capacity out there than that. Uh, This chart I like. This is showing total emission-free electricity. And there's a nuance in this emission-free definition where we don't like, well, we, me, and PV Intel, uh, we don't like the definition of renewables from the EIA. Because renewables includes burning gas from landfills, burning garbage, and other items. So yeah, it's a renewable source, but we don't care about renewables if we're burning wood and still putting emissions out. So this is emission free. And if you look at that chart, it includes nuclear, wind, hydro, solar, geothermal, and solar thermal. And so we are again growing after last year having a pullback, but we're again growing with our emission free and we're almost to 38% of all electricity being emission free. And we had a nice, a rough fall off over the last two years because we lost a lot of nuclear. Um, Nuclear went from almost 20% down to like almost 18%. So that's a big chunk of electricity that was lost. But that's just the state of nuclear right now in the U.S. Hopefully we don't lose too many more of these plants. Um, But it's cool to see us approaching 40% emission-free electricity. And, you know, this is a key argument for anybody who um, sees the BS coming about electric vehicles. You know, you often see a picture where you're, where an electric vehicle owner is mocked and they say, oh, you're driving an EV, ha ha ha, your car doesn't pollute, but your car is powered by coal. No, it's not. In fact, coal only makes up like 20% of electricity. 40% is clean, so shut up, people. Um, here is total electricity by source across the whole of the United States. And we see that fossils are under 60%. We see nuclear with its big old chunk at 17.8. Wind broke through 10%, which is awesome. Wind over 10. So now wind plus solar, which are really, for now, the two most important clean energy sources. Geothermal, I really hope, catches on and starts to grow. Um, But uh, wind and solar broke almost 15%. You know, 4.7, 4.8 plus, you know, 10.1. We're at like uh, 14, 8, 14, 9 ish. So that's cool. Um, and you know, this is just the annual report. It makes me happy to see it. Um, we're going to see a little bit slower growth rate this year from solar because the capacity deployed in 2022 was lower than 2021, sadly. Um, same for renewables, but you know, we're still building. So 
you know, it's a good report. Happy number, 4.7%. This year, without a doubt, we break through 5% of electricity from solar PV. And we'll see wind keep growing. Hopefully, nuclear stays flat. Actually, we might see a nuclear plant come online uh, in Georgia. It's scheduled to come online in April. It was scheduled to come online in, like, 2015. So, whatever, we'll see. <laughs> and then we'll have a second nuclear reactor at this same site. Yeah. probably come on next year it probably won't make it this year but that's, that's gonna Vogel, help you know right? Isn't that the name yes that? sir yeah is it a silent t i vogel i don't know how to pronounce stuff uh so I if it's vogel, vogel great. i don't i don't i don't know um great, wonderful yeah. so vogel in georgia yes um and yeah and you know, and you know if you if you are looking for really good credible information uh on the nuclear industry check out NEIS, the Nuclear Energy Information Service, based in Chicago. You know, there's a war going on in Illinois now, John, about nuclear because the state has a law saying that you cannot develop new nuclear plants. But there's a major push by companies like GE, Hitachi, these are the guys that build nuclear power plants, to develop a next generation, they call them small modular reactors, but the technology is identical for all intents and purposes. And it produces nuclear waste. And that's the problem with our fleet of 12 nuclear power plants here in Illinois is that we don't have anywhere to take the waste. And so it lives on site where the nuclear waste is generated. They put it in uh, containers and then they put the containers inside pools of water so it doesn't overheat. And it's just a disaster waiting to happen because if the water drains out of the pool, it can it can catch fire there can be problems um, you can have radioactive smoke blowing into your community and or if somebody crashes a plane into it you know there's many things that could happen we want a national plan and solution to the nuclear waste problem and we don't have that and the yucca mountains of the world have not driven forward for things like well i don't want those trains driving that nuclear waste through my community literally the communities push back on having the waste just travel through their state, much less live there long term. So um, there's a movement, though, to repeal this law that we can't have new nuclear in Illinois. And it's, as NEIS says, a nuclear war. So check it out. Um, but they host webinars with people like Mark Jacobson, who just, I mean, the dude does nothing but study the energy industry, right? And nuclear is not economical, which is why we're not building more nuclear plants in this country. It has nothing to do with this, the technology per se. It's the cost of power. Um, we can get, you know, two to four cent solar power, right? With a large scale solar facility, you can't get below 10 cents with nuclear. You're more in the 20 to 30 cent zone. And uh, so when, yeah, but... when, when, you can, when you can produce power at a quarter of the price, with wind and solar, that's what's going to grow. And that's why the XLs of the world, the major utilities in this country, are shuttering their fleets of traditional sources and investing in wind, solar, and battery. Um, you know, the nuclear pricing, I, I don't know if 20, 30 cents is uh, the number. I mean, like, uh, oh, Illinois has some of the yeah. cheapest. No, for Illinois nuclear. has some for of the cheapest. Nuclear. Well, for we don't... Nuclear. Maybe. I mean, you can, oh, just, just we can argue that, brother. I know, listen, I study Vogel. I, I definitely do. I've studied Vogel, and it's a crap project. Um, and I don't know why we are so terrible at building nuclear. I mean, I have some ideas, but if, if yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think we should be building new nuclear, and I think the federal government should just kick some people in the face and say, shut up. We have to build nukes. And get over it and let us store the waste and if you don't we're gonna we're gonna eminent domain your house and dig a pit a thousand two thousand feet deep and we're just gonna put it there one one opposed, thing or the other I'm I mean opposed to building new nuclear fundamentally and I'm, I'm opposed to it in the current scenario where we don't have a plan for the nuclear waste okay um, we yeah, don't have a, the, the reality is we don't have a plan okay and so you have this fleet I mean Twelve nuclear power plants in one state, okay, and they're just some of the cheapest electricity. They're just stockpiling this stuff. It's extremely dangerous. 
So, well, let's keep going. We 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 could do a whole show on yeah. just on nu- the nuclear industry, and some point maybe we should. Um, but today we've got more stories to cover. Solar developers yes. getting involved in solar panel factories. We report a lot on the solar module industry on this show for good reason. Right now, 70% of solar modules are made elsewhere uh, that are consumed in the United States, right? And and so we need to onshore and reshore manufacturing of solar modules. And it is happening. What's the story, John? So this story is about three, maybe four plants deals in which a solar developer has said that they are going to engage with a solar panel manufacturer and either A, explicitly partner, or B, line up their procurement contracts with the financing of a solar factory. So it's we're literally seeing solar developers saying we have so much capacity and we need to guarantee our product that we're going to get married to a factory. And and there's a few people where it's happened. And my favorite, which actually caused me much emotional consternation when I first saw the headline, is that Meyer Berger signed a deal with a developer from your home, uh, Desi. Um, I always forget what their name is. Um, uh, if we scroll down, we'll see their name. Uh, but they signed a deal for to expand the Arizona facility. And the Arizona facility from Meyer Berger went from one gigawatt to like two gigs, something like that, maybe even three, three gigs yeah. a year of manufacturing capacity with a guarantee that Desi, Desri will purchase 3.5 gigs of that capacity output. And it's explicitly stated that the payments from the solar developer to purchase the modules would be used to help finance the factory costs. And this helped Meyer Berger not have to reach out to the marketplace for more capital, more cash, because these companies, here we go, we're, they, oh, if you scroll up a tiny bit, um, uh, these companies, oh, two more paragraphs. Uh, these companies, these developers have huge capital. Here it is, uh, D.E. Oh, e. Shaw, geez. Yeah, I, I should know their name. Desri, not Desi. Um, so D.E. Shaw said that they would literally help Meyer Berger Finance. Uh, so they, the the wording was from the press release. De Shaw will pay a substantial annual down payment. This is going to help cover the cost of building a factory, and this is really interesting because solar developers they already take on so much risk, interconnection risk, uh, off taste risk, development risk, uh, just so many risks with the way regulators work and solar plants and and local zoning now they're taking on risk with factory construction and manufacturing and that speaks of at least one thing it speaks of the strong long-term viability of the large-scale solar development marketplace and the fact that banks look at a company like de shaw i mean de shaw is backed by one of the a really smart finance guy themselves but it, it says that banks and finance people are looking at the DE Shaw's of the world and saying hey your pipeline is strong enough that we're willing to risk a couple hundred million bucks building this factory because you will cover 25 30 percent of its output I that's just pretty cool and it, it speaks of a future which is a little different with solar panel manufacturing and you know there's other examples you know the first solar one it wasn't explicitly tied together uh, but first solar you know I I would put money and I don't know anything about it so this is just a talking head Um, I would put money though that first solar has a list of all of their potential deals that they could sign on a financier's desk who's funding their four, five gigawatts, seven gigawatts of upgrades of new facilities. And First Solar is going to be going from like three gigs to 10 gigs by 2025. And First Solar has signed multiple deals with large scale groups saying, we're going to sell this much capacity. And it's again, it's solar developers and their pipelines that are leading to module manufacturers getting deals. Because in the United States, we have a harsh capitalist 
finance world. In China, it's the state that has stated um, uh, we have a national security interest in funding these solar factories. And these companies, they're not necessarily always profitable because they're constantly upgrading their factories and their machines that make the modules. That eats a lot of money when you're in a downward priced product war across the globe. So it's, it's more complex to close a deal in the U.S. than China in certain finance ways. You know, in politics and connections, China is a very complex company, country as well. I'm sure there's a lot of challenges, but it's just different models. And so I'm just interested in seeing how all these companies and their huge pipelines are connecting with manufacturers. And it's cool. And so I, I covered it. And, you know, right there you have that paragraph. Even before the IRA was signed, six major developers said, listen, folks, give us some modules. We'll buy seven gigs a year from you folks if you're willing to guarantee us capacity in the United States. And that's just pretty cool. And, and then, of course, one that actually makes me sad. Solaria is no longer an independent solar module manufacturer. And I've known this for a few months, and I kind of felt it. For a few months because in the fall summer late summer of last year solaria product became very hard to get mm -hmm. and in the spring it was available in the fall things got started getting sketchy and i don't know explicitly if it's related to their merger but now there's a residential manufacturer or a residential installer who pretty much owns solaria or i guess there was a merger i don't know the dynamics of who's the big dog in the relationship, but I'm assuming that this residential company gets first dibs on all Solaria modules. And that might mean that little players like Whaling City Solar from New Bedford, Massachusetts doesn't get Solaria modules because we're too much of a small fry. And whatever, that's cool. There's plenty of other panels, but Solaria were so nice, so dark, nice, efficient. Uh, people liked them. And, and so there's good and bad about this, but it's the, the market's changing, and I think that's really what the thing is. The market has evolved, and what's going to come of it, I don't know, but it's fun to watch. Yeah, you know, I have a, a few comments about this, and there's, there's certainly at face value a certain logic, right, that if you're a major solar developer, meaning you're buying solar equipment, you have a vested interest in having a line of sight, a runway to product. And one way of doing that is to invest in the manufacturers of those uh, products, solar panels, racking, inverters. D.E. Shaw, um, David Shaw, the founder, is a computer scientist from the University of Illinois, and then went to Wall Street and became a very successful hedge fund manager. And then they propped up a renewable energy division, and now they're a major solar developer, which is very telling. Uh, that financial companies are getting into the solar industry because it's all about ROI. Um, they exist to make money and they're getting into clean energy because it is a gold rush. And that's a double edge in and of itself. But anyway, that vertical integration makes perfect sense because supply chain is brutal when your product is coming from halfway around the world and has to travel on a container from Asia to the United States, and then it has to go through a port. There's all kinds of problems that can happen. And so, yeah, onshoring and reshoring, manufacturing, it's a wonderful thing. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you for this story, because I think you do a great job of laying out um, what's going on. And a lot of it is due to the IRA legislation. It's not all IRA. We had First Solar before we had IRA. Now we just have a much bigger first solar and we have a much bigger Q cells and, um, and a growing cadre of, of uh, solar panel companies coming to the United States. And eventually the, the complete life cycle, right, from ingot to wafer to cell to panel, as we reported a couple weeks ago with Q cells with Scott uh, on the show. So it's, it's and, and this, is, this is high wage jobs, these factory jobs. It's, it's a good living and it's national security. And it, you just can't argue with these, these things. Uh, it's laughable that there's a movement in Congress to repeal the IRA legislation 
it's totally laughable because it is good for red states, it's good for blue states, it's good for everybody, and um, and it's game on. So let's move on, John. So the next story, I'm just going to say it out loud. Don't want to discuss it because it really lines up with this story we just finished talking. In Germany, there's a little bit of a movement to have a people-owned solar module manufacturing manufacturing facility. So a Volks solar module factory. I don't know how to say solar module factory in German. So Volks something, yeah. Volks module. But I just, it's just, it's it's. There's an evolution that's occurring with these modules. Makes me wonder. You know, last week I don't. I had it on one of our prior shows. I don't know if we posted it. But there's a person in Italy who's taking. Uh, uh, what we would call in South Florida Spanish tiles, you know, those, you know, just uh, clay tiles that are on a roof, and he's right. integrating solar panels and solar cells in them by hand. So, might we have a, um, uh, what would be the, uh, the word, a, a tiny industry, a cottage industry of solar mo- module makers around the world who are, because solar cells might become trivial. I, I don't know about trivial, but they might become like just widely available for everybody. And if that's the case, That'd be kind of neat. I mean, we could just have, you know, roll your own module factory type of stuff. And I don't know. They might not last 50 years, but it's 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 an evolution. There's an evolution occurring. We're all part of it. Artisan. Chris, you're awesome. That is the exact word I was looking for, Chris. Chris just commented, artisan solar panel makers. We should give, we should, uh, give Chris a raise. Chris, how much are we paying you? Uh, get on that, Tim. <laughs> So, in time, so in yeah. Time. Uh, in time. Speaking of money, we should we should uh, give a shout out to Chin Power Systems for sponsoring the show, and I'm looking forward to going to Dallas in a couple of weeks for their Innovation Day at their headquarters in Dallas, Texas. Chin is a leading manufacturer of three-phase string inverters, and everything from small commercial to utility scale. Now they have a 250 to 375 kW line of string inverters. They're doing 100 megawatt projects with these string inverters now. You think of 100 megs, you think, oh, central inverters. No, you're you're seeing large scale solar now using these uh, string inverters, which is which is very cool. So looking forward to bringing them on to our Thursday live sometime in the near future, and we'll be recording a. Uh, couple of interviews with them for the pre-recorded segment check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com and give us a rating and a review thank you chris for your comments and for your leadership in the solar panel sales world uh chris lutman uh solar panel expert so it's great to have your comments <laughs> chris is a artisan so solar. chris is a yeah chris is a developer as well he uh, helps sell modules uh, he recently sold my company about 780 kilowatts of modules for a project that is almost well the modules are almost fully installed actually the modules are installed I need to get Chris a video so he can show off um, but I also say I saw CPS uh, at the uh, Northeast show and um, in Boston uh, last week last Wednesday Thursday and, and that was uh, not an attorney you spoke with, by the way. Um, it, he, he's a guy who sounds like an attorney, apparently, but he was not an attorney. I, ta- I, I talked to Brian Wagner, their president, about that interaction. Um, so, Well, I spoke to multiple people. I spoke to a guy who definitely said he reviewed your contract, and I spoke to salespeople, yeah. and I you know, spoke to like three or four people. So, so CPS has product, which was cool, and they were smart folks when I got the sales guy, and he walked through all the details of their different inverters. Uh, you know, they have some 208V, and they have some 480V product. We were looking at their 208V because uh, we had a project that, you know, we had a 208-volt connection, and we're still figuring out how to use transformers. And their product didn't fit because it was a little too big, but it's they got inverters, so, so that's cool. Um, all right. What are we talking about next, Tim? Can we talk about Ford and the now, United States Postal Ford Service? And the USPS, uh, as, as I said in the pre-show, John, what a boondoggle it was last year when the USPS announced that they were going to buy a big fleet of ICE engine vehicles. But apparently that deal fell through. So what's the story? So a while back, uh, during a prior 
uh, regime, an individual uh, allowed the United States Postal Service to re-up its, um, its vehicles with gas vehicles, when we're obviously in a different world than spending billions on gas vehicles. And recently, probably about six months ago, that order was canceled. And so there will be no gas fleet upgrade for the United States Postal Service. With that, it was said that the USPS will shift to an all-electric vehicle procurement. This, I believe, is the first official order of that. And I believe also they're going to be Ford Sprinter vans, which really excites me as a solar contractor because so we have to give I the title. Want... We have to remember oh. that a lot of our listeners are listening to this on audio. And so this is a story right. on the Hill, USPS yep. to purchase 9,000 electric vehicles, install 14,000 charging stations. And a uh, story by Zach Budrick. So great story about a bulk purchase and the 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 mail delivery guy could soon be driving an EV, right? Absolutely. What uh, percentage of their yeah. fleet is 9,000 vehicles? I have no idea. Um, they're probably several hundred thousand, so we're talking 1%. Where's chat BG, uh, GPT when we need it? <laughs> well, I'm good at Google, so how many vehicles does the USPS own? Uh, 231,000 at the end of 2020. So yeah. 10,000 into 230, it sounds like about 5%. 10, 1, 2, 3, divided by 230, 1, 2, 3, 4.34%. So it's a start. Yep. It's a start. And I like it. Um, and they're going to be Ford Sprinters, I believe, which is a wonderful vehicle to store some solar modules in and use for your site. And so... Yeah. Uh, the speed, though, is one thing that I noticed. Very soon, and it might even be in this article, but immediately there are going to be 14,000 chargers that will be deployed at, I believe, like 75, oh, there you go, uh, 75 unique locations starting next month. So the deal was signed, and bam, they're getting to work. And so we're going to now see EV charging at your local post office. That's 14,000 chargers. I mean, the public probably won't be able to use those units, but right. whatever. Um, it, it's going to be their infrastructure for when the Jeeps at least turn into some sort of even of them. And so it's just, it's growing and it's changing. And, and the United States Postal Service is going to lead. And it's and, and a 10,000 unit, a 9250 unit order. You know, let's say these are $75,000 units. That's uh, 10,000 times 75,000. Uh, that's 75 million bucks of procurement that's going to be going to Ford for EVs. That's 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 nice. Where are they going to be built? I wonder. I, probably in Tennessee, Georgia, you know, in the southeast where all that stuff's going on. But that's 10,000 units that are going to end up getting built. And that order will grow. And then people like me, Whaling City Solar, commercial solar guy, we're going to buy an electric Sprinter van when they become available, reasonable, etc. And I can't wait to show up to install solar panels with an electric vehicle that it was at least partially charged by wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, clean electricity. It's, you know, it's just, it's the goal. And we're starting to see fruition from the transition. And and it's happening. So, so I don't know. It just feels good. It feels good to see happening. So, thank you, USPS. Well, speaking of electric vehicles, you found a story in Electrek world first charging a Chevy Bolt EV on a Tesla supercharger using Magic Dock. So apparently yes. there's a product out there called Magic Dock that you can plug a charger, a Tesla supercharger into and then jack that into your ordinary Chevy Bolt and actually charge your Bolt from a supercharger without any extra permission or how does that work? So the Magic Dock is a device made by Tesla that they attach to their supercharger network. And so if you can share it, we can uh, show the magic doc in the image uh, for those who are watching. But if you go to electric.co uh, or you just type in to Google world first charging a Chevy Bolt EV, you'll find it. It's just a little box that converts and you plug in the same charger plug 
uh, probably with a little adapter. I, I can't actually see the adapter thing there, but there's definitely an adapter. I can see it. Yep. And so you use this adapter to plug into the car. And uh, so I downloaded the Tesla app because that's where you can find them. And I now have it on my phone. And you can see at least some charging units um, uh, that are now compatible with any car. And I will be visiting some because some of them are on I-90, which heads to my brother's house in upstate New York. And so I'm looking forward to plug. Going to spend very much time on these networks, uh, at least for the next couple of years or a year and a half because for another year. And um, I don't want to pay. <laughs> so the Electrify America chargers, I'm going to keep using them as best as I can. Um, but for now, you can now bring your EV you to the largest charging, charging network. Electrify America. For through the end of uh, th through next year. Sorry, I can tell that my connection is not as strong. Sorry, everybody. Um, but uh, I have free charging, so I will do my best to avoid. I'll do my best to avoid the network, but I am going to test it out. I'll get some pictures for us to share. But now, you know, yeah, it's well, growing. So on the Tesla Weaver. app, they have I a map. I see John Weaver charging his, his uh, you drive a Hyundai, is that right? Ionic 5. Yeah, I want to see, I want to see a photo of you charging that at a, at a Tesla supercharger. Um, It'll happen soon. All right, we got got a couple more stories we can squeeze in here. Project of the week: round mount that crossed the irrigation canal. That's a cool thing. Yeah, we um, we have a lot of canals and trenches and ditches in our farmland. I don't know where this photo is from. Uh, what what where? Yeah, where is this geographically? I'll put this on screen in a second. Zimmerman PV Steel Steel. Group. I th it may have been in the Netherlands. Um, they do a lot of aggressive solar design there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it sounds. Uh, yeah, it Netherlands. Sounds, sounds European for sure. IB yep. Voigt GmbH uh, is the customer. Let me get this on screen. So, uh, so this is a, this is a unique form of racking. Is that the crux of it? No, the racking itself seems to be standard. Uh, what the key is, and when you share an image, we'll be able to see it, is that they added a new component. So you can see that component, that white bar that goes at an angle underneath. And that white bar that is, it looks like, you know, perpendicular almost, or not perpendicular, at an angle to the rest of the racking system. Well, it's perpendicular to the canal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, perpendicular to the canal. That piece allows the racking to sit on top of it. So somebody sure. said, okay, we don't have our normal helical ground screws that we can put in. How do we support this system? Engineers did some math, and they said, well, we, there it is, perfect in, image right there. Um, they said, well, we can do this a uh, span. And so what it is, it's a 20, 30-foot span of steel where the racking, instead of going into the dirt, the racking connects to this unit. And it gives strength, and it allows the unit to have its stability that it needs in order to not be lifted up by the wind. That's really what it comes down to. And it almost looks, if you, from this image, it looks like stitches or sutures. Like, ah, oh, yeah, I cut does. myself. And and it's just neat. It allowed somebody, this is, you know, this is cool. It allowed somebody to maximize their agrivoltaic, because this looks like an agrivoltaic install. And that's what's going to happen in Netherlands and many places. But it allowed somebody to maximize their agrivoltaic install on a piece of chopped up land with, you know, some extra steel for structural support. And when I saw it, I was just like, oh, I love smart engineers. I love people who are good at CAD or whatever it is that made this. Just, oh, creativity. So, good job. Neat little project. I, uh, I one day will build one. Maybe. Yeah, putting uh, putting solar on canals and ditches is a good thing, and uh, or other waterways. Um, you know, in I think this is happening in India. It's starting to happen in California now too, yep. and it reduces the you know evaporation from the canal, 
So more water gets to wherever you're trying to deliver that water to, whether that's for drinking or for farming. And um, it's a good thing. And you still get a solar field. Which is a Many must. positives. Yes. A must. Many positives here. So we got a battery story, CATL or CATL as some people call them. I, I, for some reason I just call them CATL. But CATL is easier to say. It's just conflation with the animal cattle. So I say CATL. But what's the story about CATL? You found a story in Benchmark. Um, Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. That's our friend Simon. And we can't really read the full story because uh, it's uh, subscription only. But I brought it up because the price of lithium carbonate, cobalt, and other components of some batteries has fallen precipitously from its highs of later last year, middle last year, maybe all last year. Uh, for instance, lithium carbonate was at like uh, 70,000 bucks per ton, something like that, or yeah, 70 grand per metric ton. Now it's down to 50. It's still way up over its 10 to 20 grand, 12 grand that it was a year or three ago, but it's falling. And uh, I heard, I've heard a few lines about why it's falling. One said that um, EV demand was evolving, maybe slowing uh, in China, which was the heavy market, or it might be that more capacity is coming on. So there's some, some details on why this is occurring. But what really matters though is now the largest battery manufacturer in the world, Cadle, and that's what I call them, Cadle. Uh, you okay. can call them Catal. I like my sophisticated name, Catal. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, they're now saying, all right, prices are falling. Let's beat the crap out of some of our competition and hurt their margins because we're better than them. And so they're dropping prices. And it's wonderful to see battery pricing come into a, a war because that's going to mean everybody will benefit because Cadle not only makes batteries for cars, but they make batteries for stationary energy storage for the grid and that makes me happy so so i just i like seeing anybody say that solar modules or or batteries are in a price war wonderful it's wonderful to me because i'm not a manufacturer <laughs> but uh, for everybody else you know for the rest of us folks or simple people uh it's nice to see the price of this hardware coming down it is fascinating that given the ramp up of evs how the price of lithium can ebb and flow the way it does. You'd think it would just be one direction, but um, but it ebbs and flows like so many other markets. So who knew? Let's go on to the Canary Media story. California ups renewables target again with new plan to add 85 gigawatts by 2035. Uh, story from Jeff St. John at Canary Media. Uh, with a beautiful photo, which I'll put on screen here, of a solar array in California with some beautiful California poppies in the background, which is probably blooming right now because it's spring in California. It's spring. Didn't they just have some massive snowstorm that, like, actually made snow in L.A. and stuff like that? Uh, it's true. They did. Uh, it was it was short-lived, though, I think. <clears throat> yeah. I, I hope for the um, California and Southwest's water reserves to be well. I, I know some of the atmospheric river is what they called it, um, really helped California. I don't know how much made it across the Rockies into the Southwest, but, you know, they need some liquid. I know there's a lot of snow up there, so we should see some strong hydroelectricity generation numbers from California and in the spring. And we're also gonna see some strong solar curtailment numbers in the spring because of all that hydro, but that's good for us in total. So, uh, but what this is, is, you know, California is constantly uh, working the hardest and leading the nation in figuring out how much electricity it needs to go green, uh, to go 100% clean. And I think their grid needs to be 100% by law by like 2035, it could be 2040. I know they're supposed to be energy net zero by 2040. Um, yeah. Electricity, I think, is sooner. I, I get mixed up with all the states. But if you scroll down a little bit, there's a few charts here showing where they think the capacity is going to come from. Uh, and it really, you know, there's just going to be lots of solar opportunity going forward still. Uh, we're going to have many gigawatts of solar. I mean, here we see 
up to 26 gigawatts of solar with offshore wind being a uh, a big one that could affect things because if we have a lot of offshore wind that blows in the evening i don't know what the characteristics of pacific coast wind is but if we have a lot that's going to be really massive because offshore wind can, can just can just oh, move some capacity uh, but 85 gigs of capacity potentially coming and there's gonna be a lot of batteries there's gonna be a lot of solar there's gonna be a lot of everything coming and it's just gonna keep moving I mean for now uh, California is still its primary electricity source is still natural gas and we got to get off that we got to keep going and I just I love seeing these documents come out from California because they're so well researched and it's so well pushed um, by the legislation there. So well, I love the I love this the opening paragraph here. The updated carbon cutting goals will require immense amounts of solar batteries, offshore wind, geothermal, and transmission. Can it all be built fast enough? This is a story, John, that not only applies to California; it applies to our entire nation and the entire world. Can it all be built fast enough? We have the technology, we have the wherewithal, but we have to build it faster. <laughs> and uh, to avoid climate catastrophe and uh, create a safer future, healthier, a safer, healthier future for humanity, I like to say. Um, so I didn't quite understand these three scenarios. I don't know if you do, but these are just three different scenarios, right? Of different mixes of how they're going to achieve those, uh, those carbon reduction goals. There's many ways to skin the cat, right? But what's cool here for me too is that you see large numbers, large numbers of lithium ion battery storage. And I want to do a quick segue to our channel because we have reported on numerous battery storage technology companies, and there's several more in the pipeline. So if you're not familiar with our YouTube channel, uh, I mean, all the content is on YouTube and on our audio platform, but just go to the YouTube and then you'll see the thumbnails with companies like America's Battery Factory, uh, setting up a gigafactory in Tucson, Arizona, using a very light construction method, so rapid deployment of a large factory, and then Fryer, a Norwegian battery company, also setting up a gigafactory in the US, in Georgia, in the next few years. They're building their first plant in northern Norway, but quickly moving to uh, the U.S. And on that interview with with Fryer, um, you know, I commented to the CEO, uh, I think his name is Jensen, that you know, I always look to to Europe for the future, but he he pushed back on that. He's like, look. The, the, R, the IRA legislation that you have in the U.S. is the best legislation globally for industrial policy, and, and you can feel good about that. So that was, that was pretty cool that a Norwegian thinks we have awesome legislation around the energy transition here in the U.S. Anything else about um, this story in California that you want to no, nah, California's growing. There's going to be massive batteries. Um, what's cool, our next story, which we don't need to cover because it's already time, but California is about to be passed by Texas with utility-scale solar deployed, which is yep. cool. It's good to see Texas moving. I think I saw a headline that 40% of Texas electricity was uh, emission-free. They have nuclear. They have a lot of wind. They got solar coming. They got a tiny bit of hydro. So it's, um, you know, we're building. California is going to lead. Texas, it's wonderfully, Texas is right behind, uh, taking advantage of the, the massive investments that have been done around the world. Um, and now, you know, it's the same thing we say every week, Tim. Hold on. Keep your job as best you can. Keep being smart. And, you know, if you're in the industry, you're going to be stuck in the industry because we're going to need you. So don't go anywhere. Chris, you're not allowed to quit. We need you. Tim, you either. So, you know, keep working. Well, we've done it again. Um, we've reached our hour mark, so we're going to wrap up the show here. Please check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review. Connect with us on LinkedIn. And 
how can our listeners find you, Mr. Commercial Solar Guy? CommercialSolarGuy.com is the primary way to find us. We have a nice contact us form. We'll be upgrading our website soon. Uh, you can also on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and Mastodon. Uh, just search John Fitzgerald Weaver or Commercial Solar Guy in those places. You'll find me somewhere. Um, and also I write for PV Magazine USA. Uh, I try to do 11 articles per month because, I don't know, that's somehow the number we came to. So uh, so there you go. That's awesome. Uh, what about Tim? Tim, where can people find you in Champaign, Illinois? I want them to go to cleanpowerhour.com. I also have a consulting company, cleanpower.group, but really go to cleanpowerhour.com. Check out our training tab. I have two courses on heat spring, one on selling and developing commercial solar, and one on how to decide if a opportunity is good, bad, or ugly. Um, and that's my free course. So check out the training tab on cleanpowerhour.com. With that, I want to say thank you, John Weaver, for all you do. And let's grow solar and storage. I'm Tim Montague. Take care, John.